Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, folks. Wherever you're joining us from today, welcome the Autonomous HVAC CFD 2024 release event. I'm Grant Holmes, your host for this uh, session. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm pleased to introduce our expert speakers for today, Mr. Sandeep Zaho, Mr. Robert Bean, and Mr. Anthony Amadio. Sandeep Zaho, Zado is a successful entrepreneur in the CAD CAE space. He holds a master's degree in aerospace engineering from IIT Bombay. He's co-founded companies like CC Tech, Zeus Numerics, Adaptive 3D Technologies, Learn CAX, and Simulation Hub, a cloud-based fluid flow simulation web service. Sandeep's expertise spans CAD, simulation, 3D printing, and more, working with companies like Autodesk and Shell. Robert Bean, a fellow of ASHRAE, is a director of Health Heating, HealthyHeating.com and founder of Indoor Climate Consultants Incorporated with extensive experience in high-performance building systems. Robert is an ASHRAE follow, fellow, distinguished lecturer, contributing significantly to the field. And Anthony Amadio, brings over 15 years of engineering design experience to the table. He's the owner and mechanical design engineer at PE Load Calcs, LLC, and his expertise lies in thermal sciences and HVAC design, making him a valuable contributor to our event. Today's agenda, we are packed with valuable insights. We're going to delve into the details of autonomous HVAC CFD 2024, the recipe for standard 55 compliance, exploring the importance of heat load calculations, the AH, AHC 2024 new features, and an open panel discussion and Q&A. And now I'm going to hand over the virtual mic to Sandeep Zaho. Sandeep, it is all yours. Thank you, Grant. And thanks, Robert, Tony, and all the audience that have joined us for the live event. Um, I welcome you uh, from wherever you are joining now. Uh, the agenda for today's meeting, uh, as uh, Grant has outlined, is about introducing Autonomous HVAC CFD 2024. Uh, we launched the first version in uh, uh, 2023. This is our second version. And uh, so we will see uh, what are the new development that we have done uh, here. As a HVAC professional, we know that uh, HVAC is a complicated topic. Uh, it involves uh, uh, different branches uh, and it's a journey in itself. So I thought, why not to go through the journey of HVAC design uh, in real practice? What happens? What are the challenges uh, users uh, face? Uh, one thing that uh, you would realize uh, once you start to work in HVAC, that it is a multi-objective design process. Uh, you have to uh, work on uh, like building envelope, heat load calcs, HVAC equipment sizing, energy calculations, uh, ASHRAE compliance, a lot of those things. And each of these objectives uh, need to be either minimized or maximized. So you would like to make sure that your home, your offices are very secured, their life is uh, longer, so you want to maximize their life. You would like to minimize the heat loads uh, because that will impact uh, on energy. Uh, you would also like to size the equipment as uh, small as possible so that there's a, a, a less uh, cost on uh, capital expenditure and then subsequently operational expenditure. Energy has become a, a, a focal point, right? Uh, everyone wants to make sure that we are able to produce the same outcome with the least amount of energy because it has a direct impact on carbon footprint that we have. Then there are building code compliances, ASHRAE compliances. You want to make sure that you are compliant with all that uh, compliances are there. But as HVAC professional, you are also uh, open to uh, risk and liability. So you also want to make sure there are none, uh, but there are uh, there could be some risk. So how, how we can mitigate that, how we can reduce the uh, uh, risk associated with the faulty designs. Uh, as a uh, end uh, users, uh, they want to make uh, the, every, every person in the space want a good thermal comfort, right? 
So you want to maximize the thermal comfort, whatever the way that is possible, uh, optimize it in a sense, uh, some sense, and also to improve the indoor air quality. Indoor air quality has taken a center stage post COVID, and then now everyone has started has become very cognizant about this fact. And uh, we want to make sure that you know while we minimize the uh, energy bill, we minimize the equipment size, but we still able to provide uh, a good ventilated air. Uh, good quality air because on that our uh, physiology, our uh, thinking, our innovation, our creativity, all of those are depend on the indoor air quality, our health. So uh, this process uh, is many times uh, uh, is a very iterative because objectives are many times opposite to each other, and it's a some sense of conflict that you need to resolve to come up with a really good optimum design. And then we have so many tools, right? Uh, we have a, a Revit for the BIM modeling. We have AutoCAD for 2D layouts. We have construction cloud for maintaining your all the files, data. Uh, then you also have a hit load calculation, energy simulations. You have a meshing tools. Uh, you have a teams to collaborate. You have post-processing tools, ERP software. And all these tools are silos in itself many times. So how do we actually uh, connect all of this uh, software and create a, a single application is a, a is a, 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 a always a challenge. So what we realize rather than clubbing all this together, what we need to do is somehow connect them seamlessly. So when we started to talk to our customers, what we realize is that uh, let's say they're working on certain indoor environment project uh, where they want to start with a building design that is coming from Revit. Uh, then you have a, uh, to do a fluid volume extraction. Then you do a, a envelope calculation, heat load calculation, uh, apply those as a boundary condition. You do a HVAC sizing, you do a, a, a ADS system design, put up them and then create a basically a simulation model. This itself takes definitely some time, but it takes uh, kind of less time as compared to when you start to iterate it. So let me explain what I mean by that. Let's say you have a, a change request from a customer. You have a change request from a different stakeholder. So it can come either from a new Revit file or it could be a new hit load calculation. So once you get that changes, uh, as a engineer, what you have to do is you have to first refer what was earlier done, what are the new changes, and how do you apply these changes to a new simulations? So it's a really lot of uh, human intensive manual work that one has to do. Once you have done that, then you need to again size your equipment again because your uh, load calculations are changed, your design has changed. So you have to go through that again. Again, you have to refer what was earlier, what was new, map it. Again, go through a, a long manual process. You might want to change the now different ADS systems. Again, this means synchronization with the earlier version and the new version. And then you go ahead and create a new simulation model. No wonder, you know, this takes so much more time that many people stay away from using CFD in indoor environment simulations. It can add as much as uh, eight hours. I would have seen people spending more like a days and weeks many times. So we wanted to uh, break this barrier and help them to uh, create a seamless workflow. So this is how we actually uh, build our uh, application in which all of these components are connected. You have an integrated designer, you have a, a, a configurator tool, scenario, simulation, and visualization tools. Our user definitely love the simulations that we do. Uh, the thing we do with Ashley 55 compliance, PMV calculation, indoor air quality visualization, they're really happy. But we realize that they have certain concerns. Like for example, they said, can configurator and scenarios today be improved? Yes, we listen to that. About the sketcher, they, they really don't want to go through it for a large project. For a small project, they love it. But when you want to work on a project like big malls, airports, it's not that much scalable, right? You would like to have a, like a professional tool like Revit or AutoCAD and directly bring that design here. So these are the challenges that we faced. And then we said like, oh, okay, like how do I solve these challenges? And we also knew that if we just build a, a file-based workflow, again, user would need to spend so much time to correct that uh, uh, or map all this data. So what we decided for the first three component, we will 
drive it completely through Revit. We will drive it through data exchanges. There is no file. You just click a button, the data comes into Simulation Hub, and then you can just leverage Simulation Hub to do uh, the thing that you love, that is the uh, thermal comfort uh, calculation, indoor air quality, all of this. So in, in, in the process, like what we have done is we have connected uh, our application with Revit. How, how we have done it, because this is a little bit new stuff for many of you, is uh, now you can do a design in Revit. Uh, you upload that as an exchange to a ACC, that is Astrodis Construction Cloud. And now that can be used in Inventor. That can be directly come into autonomous HVAC CFD. And it will come create a complete layout without any manual intervention. So what you see in Revit, you will be able to see in autonomous HVAC CFD. Every property, every uh, material property, thermal properties, constraint, everything is brought into autonomous HVAC CFD with a click of button. The good thing is, if you keep on modifying your Revit design, you just again click, it will create a new version and it will come here. So no more files, you just click it, it will come here. Here you have to, again, uh, it will show, okay, this is new data. Would you like to start with a new simulation? And you can do a new simulation. So that's the uh, thing that we have done with uh, 2024 uh, uh, release. And uh, now I think all the users who are going to use this are going to get utilized with a connector system. So now same data can be uh, sent to AutoCAD or it can be sent to Teams, PowerPoint, Civil 3D, anywhere. So all this are you have become a part of this uh, important ecosystem that would definitely solve some of the problems that uh, we started with. In our uh, applications, uh, it's it's very simple. You just uh, go to Revit uh, 2024, 2023, uh, use our connector. It, that connector will uh, push the data to Autodesk Construction Cloud. And then in our application, you just pull that data. So it's a... Uh, it, it will show you that there is a new exchange and then that uh, you can uh, download. Both of these connectors are uh, available from today on uh, Autodesk App Store. Uh, both of them are for free of cost. You can just go ahead, download it, and you will be able to see uh, they appear into uh, Revit menu or uh, ACC menu. So users across the globe have been using, uh, uh, you know, AHC 2023. There are uh, really great consulting companies, uh, architecture companies, space company like ISRO have been uh, exploring our application for various uh, uh, spaces. And they have been using it for offices, residential projects, malls, uh, clean rooms. So I think uh, it, it has really captured the imagination for a uh, lot of people and then they have uh, really liked what we have done and they want more and we are listening to them. So if you are one of them, uh, definitely, uh, I think you will see what, whatever you have uh, suggested us, we have tried to incorporate it and we will do it more uh, going forward. So some of the uh, key features of uh, AHCs are like, I think I already talked about data exchange. We now got a complete Azure 55 compliance report generation tool. So it goes through the complete simulation and generates the compliance report. It, it reports what it is. If you are having a really good space design, it will tell that, these are the spaces compliant. These are the spaces not compliant. It also does a lot of uh, detail analysis about lo local discomfort, which is a part of Azure 55 compliance. Again, reports all of that. And th that has become really good tool for, uh, uh, I think, some of the early users who are trying this product already. Uh, we have built a new technology about uh, around AI. So we have built a, a comfort AI uh, a, a technology, which basically just takes the, your building design uh, at early stage and starts to tell you what sort of uh, PMV and local discomfort. They are not that accurate like what CFD will produce. They are uh, pretty decent to do a lot of engineering work. So it gives you the, the direction sense. So it starts to tell you, uh, hey, are you going to have a certain discomfort? Are you going to have a higher draft rating? And you can start to adjust your things. And this works in some cases just five seconds or 30 seconds. And uh, it helps you to uh, optimize your design. You don't need to waste your cloud credit on some of the CFD simulations which is not needed because CFD does take a lot of time and uh, computing. And once you finalize certain set of designs, you can now go with our CFD tool and do complete detail analysis. And that's how you will get Azure 50 by compliance. We have also added a feature about design load calculations. So there are uh, 
uh, a complete load calculation that is given. It's very simple uh, and easy to uh, use tool that we have built. Uh, I think because if your hit load calculations are not right, definitely CFD doesn't uh, produce a good uh, outcome. So uh, Tony is going to talk about that. Ashley 55, uh, Robert is going to talk about that. So I will leave to them. And uh, we also improved a uh, lot about solver. Our solver itself is now 40% faster. Uh, there are new solver schemes. There are a lot of optimization that we have done around CAV, VAV, uh, and different uh, things that goes into the doing such kind of applications. We have built a new performance indices, in a sense, the performance indices that are available. So now user can access what is the air change effectiveness in a space, what is the ADPI, and those helps them to definitely uh, gauge the, uh, how good is their design and how it will uh, work into the actual site. So without taking much time, uh, I will just uh, go through our uh, a demo of the new application and. Uh, let the work speak for itself. Welcome to our autonomous HVAC CFD app demo, where we're excited to take you on a journey through the latest release. In this video, I'll be your guide, showcasing the seamless new workflow and unveiling a host of exciting new features. Once you log in into our platform, you will reach to Project Dashboard. Let me walk you through the simple steps of using this app. Create a new project to get started. You can import a building design model from the Revit or create one from scratch. To import, open your model in Revit. First, validate the building model using the AHC connector. If you encounter any errors, correct the model and validate it again. Once the model is successfully validated, Create a data exchange of your model to upload a building model to Autodesk Construction Cloud. Now you can access your Revit data exchange through AHC. Next, import airside systems. You can import multiple airside systems for your building design model to explore the complete design space. Specify the ceiling height of your plan and the nature of adjacent floors. Search the map for your site's nearest weather station, and the app will collect the weather properties autonomously from this station. We are now ready with the floor plan and building components. You can import floor plan, people, seating arrangements, etc. Next set the building orientation. Obtain an accurate design load calculation report for heating and cooling by specifying space and system design parameters. Afterward, customize the report according to your requirements. The report can be downloaded to refer the further design calculations such as space airflow requirements. You can now proceed to configure airside systems. You can experiment with different configurations by creating multiple airside systems. Now we move to the design configuration stage. Select the type of HVAC system. Define thermal zones and thermostat spaces. Provide any other relevant parameters. Click next to create scenarios. And specify the number of occupants and the day of the year. Create multiple scenarios to see how your designs perform year-round. Confirm loads on each building component before simulations. Use the power of AI to explore your designs using our Comfort AI tool. The tool will enable you to discover your design to assess thermal comfort and local discomfort within no time. Click next to start setting up your simulations. Choose the simulations you want to run and click submit. Review the credits that you will be charged and submit them for simulation. Track the progress of your simulations on the run page while high-performance compute clusters are doing the math in the cloud. Within a few hours of computing, 
our app updates you with a notification. Now, you can visualize thermal comfort gives you a quick snapshot of each occupant's satisfaction through emojis. Check the local thermal discomfort compliance for each occupant in the space based on ASHRAE Standard 55. Assess the indoor air quality levels in your project in an intuitive and informative way. If your spaces are well ventilated by checking for clouds of concentration of carbon dioxide. Average carbon dioxide levels in the room. Get detailed insights for each occupant by viewing surface plots. Get granular insight into flow and thermal parameters by slicing through the three-dimensional space in the contour plots section. We measure each person's thermal comfort, air velocity, diffuser effectiveness, hot and cold spots, and draft ratings. Cast light on invisible air flow patterns through the flow lines visualization. Receive a compliance report on ASHRAE Standard 55, assessing compliance with PMV and local thermal discomfort including radiant temperature asymmetry, vertical temperature difference, draft, and floor temperature for each design. Start your free trial today at www.simulationhub.com. So this was the introduction to our application. And uh, so I, I will come back again for the uh, more detailed uh, review of some of the features. So I will hand over now to Brian to take it from Thanks, Sandeep. That's uh, more than a couple nights of late night programming, isn't it? It's incredible software you've built uh, addressing pain points of HVAC professionals and simplifying their challenges. That's good stuff. Thank you, Sandeep, for that insightful work and uh, that simulation has propelled us towards. Next, I'm going to invite Robert Bean to elaborate on the significance of ASHRAE 55 compliance. Robert, the floor is yours. Thanks again for having me uh, present uh, some of the knowledge that I have on this subject matter. I think it was uh, almost a year ago that uh, I had the opportunity to do some uh, introductory discussions about 55 um, and always a, always a treat to be able to share more knowledge about it. Um, today we're going to talk about one of my um, more passionate areas about thermal comfort, which has to do with local thermal discomfort. And the reason for that is that in the world of compliance with ASHRAE 55, most people have the main factors figured out, uh, that those that are familiar with the standard, as you saw from the results, um, I think it was a total of, uh, I think it was 65 and 15, 75, 80% of people either didn't know about the standard or don't really know about it in detail. And that's pretty consistent with some of the information that I've uh, garnered over the many, many decades. So for those that do know the standard, they're very familiar with the six main factors, but the local discomfort factors apply uh, when two conditions are met. And we'll talk about that. And failure to address those local uh, factors oftentimes leads in non-compliance with the standard. And people think that they're actually complying because they've met the first six but they've failed to meet the other um, local factors. So I want to talk about uh, today in a very short period of time, what we're going to achieve. When, you're, when we're done with my presentation, you're going to have a real understanding of why the 55 compliance is so important, why we need to look at the local discomfort factors in addition to the general factors. We're certainly going to look at um, building codes and how building codes actually fail to um, serve the needs of the occupants in terms of sensation perception and their, re and their reaction to the indoor environment. And you'll find out that very quickly. And then how indoor environmental quality, which includes thermal comfort and, and air quality, lighting, sound, how all of these ultimately have an impact on uh, energy consumption, preservation, conservation, and then also where that fits into the world of decarbonization. 
One of the things about the standard that is really important is that when we as practicing engineers apply the principles, we need to apply all of them. We can't cherry pick which ones we want to uh, use and which ones we're going to ignore. Compliance with the standard means that we need to address all of the factors that the standard defines. And we've talked many, many times about the standard and different programs, including the ones that we did last year. Um, and there, there's just tons of information online that talk about the requirements for compliance of all of the metrics. One of the things that I would like to share, and this is, is somewhat consistent with the, the poll results, is that over many, many years, I would poll audiences on their knowledge of ASHRAE Standard 55. And ultimately, it came down to less than 1% of the practitioners that I would address or teach would be able to do a compliance test. Many, many people, like almost statistically what we saw here today, 25% or something like that, are familiar with the standard. But if you actually asked individuals if they could actually do a compliance test, it's an incredibly low number. And that those statistics ran for almost 18, 19 years that I did the surveys with my audiences. So that lack of knowledge, uh, what I have started to refer to as illiteracy, and I use the word illiteracy with respect, but also with impact, because when you have an industry with less than 1% literacy in a standard, you have the consequences, and the consequences show up in post-occupancy evaluations. And the Center for the Built Environment have done many, many studies looking at data points for office buildings and will publish information like this, that you know most people are not satisfied thermally with their built environments. And this is significant. When you think about this ratio that some of us are familiar with, 100 to 10 to 1, when you look at buildings, office buildings, the number one cost is not the cost of the energy, which is the one, or the operational cost, which is the 10, but in fact, it's the human cost. It's the salaries, it's the benefits, it's the absenteeism, it's the presenteeism, which is people who are there, but they're not, <laughs> they're not feeling well. So the number one cost in buildings is, is actually the people. And so when you have non compliance with standard 55, which is in part a consequence of people who are illiterate. They don't understand the standard or how to apply it or how to show compliance. Then the consequences are is that we have people in spaces that aren't able to do what they are required to do at the level that we would expect people to do it. And then be and the reason for that is that become distracted by their indoor environment. And there's lots of studies that go into that. So compliance is really important. And when we talk about compliance with ASHRAE Standard 55, it's really important to understand that there are many, many ingredients in the cake. The, the title for the this presentation was the recipe and the ingredients comprised of the general factors, which you see in yellow on your screen. And so we start with people, what are they wearing and what are they doing? So that's the clo and the mat rate. And then we also look at relative humidity and the air velocity, and then the dry bulb temperature, and then the mean radiant temperature. And we've talked about that before. And th those factors um, comprise or define what we call as the sort of the general factors. But in addition to the general factors, if the clo rate and the MET rate are at certain values, and we're going to get into that in a second, then we are forced to, as application engineers, to now consider the local discomfort factors. And those local dis uh, discomfort factors include the floor surface temperature, they include stratification, includes radiant asymmetry, and includes drafts. And drafts not only across the body, but also across the ankles. And these are very important when people are wearing a, a less clothing and doing low metabolic activities. And they will complain about their environments. And we had the Wall Street Journal here visiting us, uh, I think a year ago, and we were talking about the discomfort that occurred in offices due to high window to wall ratios, low performance glass, poor shading, and all of that created these radiant asymmetry problems. 
uh, obviously boosted up the cooling load. And the consequence of that is people would drive the temperatures down. And of course that created failures in compliance with ASHRAE standard 55. So these are the ingredients that we have to take a look at. And when we get the ingredients right, and all of these we can assess uh, through the sciences, the process of looking at the movement of mass and energy uh, across an enclosure and through a space. And because we understand this material uh, intimately, we, we have lots of experience with this as a society, as an industry of application engineers, we can predict uh, whether elements, certain components of the recipe aren't quite right and that will result in a failure rate, which is why I love the software tool that we're here to talk about today, because it's a tool that gives us a visualization. We can actually see what's happening in, in a space and we can see whether the people are compl or the space is compliant, whether the people will be happy with it or not. And the new version that's come out allows us to look at the local discomfort factors, which is, a, which is really important. So when we get all of the ingredients right, so we have the right air temperature and we've solved the mean radiant temperature problem by having the high performance enclosures. And when we get the air velocity moving through a space and across the occupants at a, at a speed that's not disruptive, when we control the relative humidity in the space and we get everything else, the local stratification, radiant symmetry, all of these things, when they're running in harmony, then we have a high probability of being compliance with the standard. And that's what the PMV and the PPD metrics are all about. And this came about from the early work that uh, Olaf Anger and uh, Fred Rolls and other people, the early researchers uh, developed. And they said, if you get everything right, then you're going to have a high probability of people being comfortable. And so thus the PMV, the predicted mean vote, and the PPD, the percentage of people dissatisfied. So we know that when things begin to fail, um, and oftentimes that's related to architecture, by the way, more so than the mechanical systems, that a higher probability of people will be uncomfortable. So the standard defines what, we, what we're expecting. And so we want to be sort of in that 80 to 90 percent of people satisfied and as you saw in the earlier slides we're nowhere near uh, that kind of compliance with the standard so one of the problems we have actually is our building codes and i really hope there's some code officials online today if not maybe those that are affiliated with code officials you can influence uh their understanding of the built environment and how that relates to energy because so many governments around the world right now are so focused on energy 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 and oftentimes it's to um, it will result in a failure in compliance with 55. So you have to they're 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 joined they're 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 connected. And so you can't have energy efficiency without indoor environmental quality. And you need indoor environmental quality in order to preserve and conserve energy, and also to in, uh, improve the efficiency of your equipment. So typically this is where the failure point occurs. Is actually industry the building industry design industry uses building codes as a design metric and lots of codes particularly in north america will reference an air temperature um and that if you can maintain <clears throat> 72 degrees or 22 degrees celsius uh based on the loads that you've calculated your conductive and infiltration loads you know you take some air out put some air in as long as you can maintain 72 degrees then you're in compliance with the building code, but you're not in compliance with ASHRAE standard 55. And we, even to this day, after all the decades of work that we have done and we know and we apply the standards, people still will use air temperature as a proxy for thermal comfort. And it's not, it's like saying baking soda is a cake. And it, it's, we simply need to pay attention to all of the metrics, including what we're here today to talk about, which is the local discomfort factors. So the building codes wants us to think about compliance with building codes as a very simple metric, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, but the people in the buildings don't experience it in that simplified way. They experience it with all of their environmental sensory systems, and they do it in a very much a, a transient, ambiguous way, because what happens to a building uh, as the sun comes up in the morning, the building starts to get loaded with shortwave radiation from the sun, and so the solid surfaces absorb it, that's conducted through into the interior and it's released as long wave radiation. Some of the short wave radiation comes through the fenestration systems, depending on the solar heat gain coefficients and the shading that's there. And that short wave radiation now enters the space and so that contributes to discomfort. 
some of the shortwave radiation is absorbed by the interior surfaces and then it gets converted to long wave radiation. So you got short wave radiation and you got long wave radiation. In addition to that, you've got relative humidity. You've got different people doing different things, wearing different clothes. You've got buoyancy of air to think about in terms of stratification, drafts. All of these things come into play. And although the illustration that you see in front of you might seem like, well, there's a lot of stuff, and there is, the reality is, is that every day, every conscious moment, we are actually experiencing these things. It's just sometimes we just get too busy to even think about it. But if you actually actually sat in a space, closed your eyes and let your thermal systems take over, you can identify the drafts and you can identify the moisture content and you can feel the space in terms of the radiant effect on you. So you can actually experience these things. And when you start to understand that, it actually becomes quite simple. And that's one of the things I like about the software tool that we're talking about today is it takes a lot of these elements and puts it into a graphical representation and simplifies the, the visual description of what people are actually experiencing. Well, you can see the visual response of people in buildings. All you have to do is pay attention when you're walking around office buildings and schools and hospitals is that people will do whatever they can to adopt to their space, adapt to their space. And everything from using duct tape to tape up diffusers to using tinfoil on windows to block the shortwave radiation, they will do whatever they can. And so these are transient conditions that are not homogenous, that are very ambiguous as the building experiences the time of day in the, in the, in the summers. And again, if you think about in terms of draft and, and uh, thermal stratification, and you get buildings like this in cold climates that are all glass, and there's no way at design conditions that these spaces are compliant with 55. Well, the tool that you're going to be that you're seeing today allows us to look at that, and we can say, well, this space because of the window performance and the amount of glass and the conditions between the inside and the outside is just going to create a whole bunch of downdraft which is gonna cause discomfort, particularly for the people that are working in that space, like the concierge. So radiant asymmetry and floor temperatures, again, things that we need to take a look at. What are the temperature differences that are created by oftentimes solar gain on a building or poor performance in the enclosure? These create different temperatures on either side of the body and the human sensory system picks that up, processes it in the brain and says, well, this isn't very comfortable. Well, if we can model that with the software tools, and then we can go back to the architectural team and the clients and say, this is what people are going to experience in this space. And we can resolve that now before the building gets built by looking at how much actual glass do we need for lighting? How much do we need it for thermal comfort? And can we reduce the amount of glass or can we improve the, uh, the performance of that glass? All of these decisions can be made very quickly and then you can modify the design as you're going along rather than having to do a post-occupancy evaluation to find out, oh, oh, oh we, we screwed up, right? So that's important that we do these up front. And there's lots of tools that can show us where the problems exist. And this is one, this came from one of the publications out of Riva, looked at the effect of shading on the outside, the inside, and the temperature of, of glass. And even high performance glass in the middle of winter here in Canada can get incredibly hot, right? But at nighttime, that glass can drop temperature. So you can see easily 30, 40 degree temperature changes on the inside surface temperature of glass. Well, if you've got lots of glass, it's like, it's like going from being in a furnace to, to being in a freezer all in one day. Well, it's no wonder people complain about that. Well, we can solve that ahead of time by looking at the consequences of our, of our choices in architecture and um, enclosure designs and the, and mechanical systems. So um, that's on the radiant asymmetry and floor temperature. And some for some reason, my screen is froze up. Let's see if we can't. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what's, I've, my just, screen is froze up, but that's okay. We'll just keep, <laughs> we'll just run with this. So. When you look at the local discomfort factors, the radiant asymmetry, which is the result of different surface temperatures around the body, floor temperatures, which we can calculate, then if the floors are too hot or too cold, then people will express discomfort with that. We can look at stratification. 
Stratification very much is determined by the building performance and also the type of mechanical systems that we have. And we know that in poor buildings uh, with the air-based systems, exclusively air-based systems, let's say, for example, in a um, brick construction building, maybe it's a warehouse or an industrial building, that oftentimes we can see huge stratification in a building, sometimes 15, 20 degree difference between floor temperatures and the ceiling. Well, that can change based on the building performance and the type of the heating system that you use. So we know stratification uh, is, an, is an issue. And then drafts, particularly around the ankles and around your neck. Again, these are tools, with these types of tools that we're look, talking today about, we can actually predict these drafts. And so by resolving, again, looking at architecture and closure design, the type of mechanical systems, we can resolve them ahead of time. So this is important. And one of the sort of the, one of two last messages I have here for the audience is that when you look specifically at the general factors, so we're talking about clothing, mat rate, relative humidity, dry bulb temperature, radiant temperature, air velocity, that we can actually be in compliance with standard 55 except if people start having uh, met rates uh, less than one point or clothing 1.3 and 0 0.7, then we can have local dissatisfaction, discomfort with the standard because the people are wearing light clothing and doing low met work. And so that forces us when we get to those criteria that we say, okay, we need to do an assessment on our local discomfort. <laughs> So we can calculate radiant temperature asymmetry. It's a very simple calculation. Um, we can do calculations on floor temperatures. Those are relatively easy to do. But the challenge, in, the ones that are challenges are the stratification and the drafts. And there's no better tool than CFD to actually model that. I don't know of any other tool other than doing the uh, base calculations, which are very complex and time consuming and no no application engineer that i know of can actually has the time to do the, the base calculations by hand or even with a computer that's where this the cfd tools come in handy because you can actually do them very quickly you can look at the stratification and the drafts and then be able to predict whether people are going to be uncomfortable or not so the general factors the personal factors the local discomfort factors those are the ingredients when you get them right you're going to have compliance with the standard and what you find going forward into this, this world where we're looking at electrification and decarbonization, how important the architecture is to get the loads down. But it's not enough just to reduce the loads. And I know from my own practice, um, I've retired now, I haven't practiced engineering for about three or four years, but when we incorporated standard 55 into our design, the number of problems we had went down. But the consequence or the benefit of designing good buildings and getting the loads down was not only compliance with ASHRAE 55, but also 62.1, 62.2. Um, but we also then started to see the preservation and conservation of energy that everybody talks about. In other words, conservation and preservation were byproducts of actually achieving the desired indoor environment. And that's been my message now for many decades is that, yes, energy is important, but energy preservation, conservation, efficiency, including exergy efficiency, are all byproducts of actually doing good architecture and good enclosure and using 55 and 62.1 and now 241 as the guiding principles for design. And when we do that, what you find is that as the loads go down, the compliance goes up, and then what you can do with this information is with electrification and decarbonization is you can take heat pumps and you can marry them up to large surface area heat exchangers, which drops the temperature down in heating and increases the temperature in cooling, which then per increases the efficiency of the chillers and the heat pumps and the boilers or solar systems or whatever it is that you're using. And by doing that, you're actually getting what's called high exergy efficiency. In other words, there's low entropy. So anytime you can marry renewable systems to heat pumps, to large surface area heat exchangers, it will never get any better than that in our lifetime in terms of exergy efficiency. And I wish we had more time to talk about that, but 
the genesis, the DNA, the, the alpha before the omega always comes down to the indoor environment and thermal comfort ASHRAE 55 is one of those principles. So, so uh, I'm going to end my presentation there. Thank you very much for the chance to, to share that knowledge. In our autonomous HVAC CFD, uh, user can see the uh, the cold draft that is uh, falling on his uh, uh, body. So uh, he, he can uh, accurately measure the temperatures and then the velocity, the discomfort that it is going to produce. Uh, we just now, which uh, Robert explained to us. We are also uh, able to uh, find out the effectiveness of uh, each of these HVAC systems, uh, like the stratification things, uh, what. Uh, Robert mentioned, like we can measure uh, whether there is a really mixing happening well, what sort of uh, HVAC system is more suited for a particular environment. And uh, we can also uh, then take it to the indoor air quality and then the uh, uh, how much is the uh, AD pair for a particular system, how, how good is the uh, air change effectiveness in a, for a particular uh, uh, area. So I, I just wanted to quickly go through some of these uh, visuals uh, to connect with what Robert was mentioning. So thanks, Robert, for giving the context to the whole presentation uh, yeah. and you know helping us to uh, make that sense. You wanted to say something. Well, I had a question for Robert. Can you share a captivating project or case study from your experience that demonstrates how thermal comfort considerations had a notable impact on outcome? <laughs> I got lots of examples. Just a short one. Um, we don't have to go into a... Uh... Yeah. So I we had just done a large industrial facility, about 100,000 square feet. It was a multi-purpose, like welding shop, and there was water treatment. Anyways, um, where I'm from, the design condition is minus 40 degrees C. That's the wintertime design condition. And we worked with the, the building designers and the client to improve the efficiency of the building. Now, this is a large, large building. We were able to convince them to use under slab insulation throughout the whole building. Uh, we convinced them to reduce their window to wall ratios. We convinced them to do radiant heating for their thermal comfort, dedicated ventilation for the ventilation system, which was particularly important for the welding shops and the carpentry shops. I'm down in Arizona, uh, minus 40 degree up in Calgary. I'm down in the South hiding from the cold. And I get a call from the client, Andy was his name. And Andy said to me, he said, Robert, at minus 40, your original design was uh, to be able to heat this space with 100, 105 degree Fahrenheit water temperatures. And we're at design conditions and we're completely comfortable. Like nobody's complaining about cold, none of that stuff. And we want to drop the temperature down to see how low we can go. Now, for those that, or in the application of engineering, clients don't call you up and say, can we lower the heating water temperature to see how low we can go at minus 40 degrees C? They're, they're cranking up the temperature, right? So I said to Andy, I said, Andy, by all means, how let's find out how low we can go at design conditions. He called up later and he says, Robert, we can maintain uh, with supply temperatures of around 95 degrees, compliance with ASHRAE 55. The return temperature back to our boilers, by the way, are 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and they're condensing like crazy. And I was in Arizona, wow. and I was smiling, and I'm going, that's what design is all about. So we... Very cool. Very, yeah, very... Yeah, very yeah, warm is the better. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, that's one story. Well, thank you, Robert, for all that. We appreciate that. Well, next up, we have Anthony Amadio, and he's going to shed light on the world of heat load calculations. And Anthony, it's all yours, buddy. Hi, hi, awesome. You know, uh, I'm a design engineer. Um, you know, I've been doing this stuff for over 10 years, doing load calculations, duct sizing, register sizing, ADPI calculations. And, and by the way, I'm kind of new to uh, the standard uh, 55, uh, relatively new, uh, just like many of your audiences. Um, but that's a tough question. Um, we always start with the heat loss, heat gain calculation. We always start there. And, and it's, you know, maybe safe to say that maybe that is the most crucial. But, you know, we, we do heat loss and heat gain calculations to right size equipment for many reasons. Probably a lot of you guys 
you know, heard. I mean, you don't want to oversize equipment. You'd be short cycling. You'd be, you know, wear and tearing your equipment. You'd be consuming a lot more energy. Of course, you don't want to undersize in a, a system or you won't meet heating and cooling conditions on design days. But by the way, as, as Dr. Bean was talking about too, absolutely, you could right size a system and still have a bunch of problems. Trust me when I say I right size many buildings, but do we have airflow problems or distribution problems? Maybe someone deviated from my design and uh, or maybe the envelope has changed after the fact and uh, after what was designed. But it's kind of, you know, I would put uh, occupant comfort as a number one, but that's a tough question. Uh, I, I don't think uh, any one of those is a wrong answer. Um, so, yeah, so we do heat loss, heat gain calculations. That's where it all starts for a, a mechanical engineer designer. Um, you know, uh, one of the benefits to right sizing, I always tell people, is I can justify my fees. You know, if I'm doing a, a, an average size commercial building and someone's got a couple of, you know, five ton package units or, or, or um, even in some restaurants with high occupancy and kitchen and ventilation, I've seen mechanical plans on a good sized restaurant they were asking for geez, uh, 25 tons, 28 tons, and I, I get them down to 15 to 20 tons, you know, maybe I saved a package system and I made quite a bit of money and, you know, uh, hooray me, I get more work. It's great. Um, but, but it starts right there, heat loss, heat gain calculations, and then right sizing the equipment based on those design temperatures, the indoor, outdoor, if we're talking heat pumps, air conditioning systems, um, and of course, you know, even elevation, you know, if we're talking, say, gas furnace heat, you know, when we're up at high elevation, we lose some BTU, okay? Um, but we need to convert, you know, BTUs into space to CFMs. We do that by picking the equipment. Then after that, you know, we're looking at it, you know, now we know how much CFM is in each space. So so the importance of an accurate HVAC design is starting with the heat loss, heat gain, starting with the equipment selection. And now we're talking about proportioning the CFMs into each space. Now, we're still kind of talking thermodynamics. We're really not even talking comfort yet. Um, but these are the procedures that we do. Um, I did say satisfy temperature set points. As Dr. Bean was saying, you're right. That's how we look at things is just saying, hey, look, we did our job. We're compliance on the building code. Are we giving occupant comfort? Maybe not. You know, uh, there's a good chance that we may not be, depending on if someone is near a window or where that person is positioned or what their metabolism or clothing level may be. Um, this is what's so fascinating about airflow distribution. Uh, you know, and I agree with uh, many of you guys have been saying and, and uh, Sandeep and, and Robert that, man, there's no other tool other than CFD to really get that flow visualization and see, hey, you know, are we just dumping air on someone? You know, what's the local humidity or the local radiant temperature, the draft, all that stuff. Um, before I, I was doing ADPI hand calcs, so, you know, it's kind of generic for a box of nine foot or 10 foot ceiling heights. And, you know, you know, assuming my diffuser was going to be in the center of the space, uh, but maybe there's lighting in the way. Um, and a lot of times people are using 24 by 24 ceiling grills. But if we have a little bit of CFM, we're just going to be dumping cold air on somebody, having a smaller grill or register, getting more throw out and stuff like that. ADPI was a good guide, but it still didn't even really ensure occupant comfort. Um, you know, why am I talking about these basics? I know I'm kind of going a little bit back. Um, number one, well, what I have is a number four, but probably a number one for mechanical designers, forgive me, is saying liability. You know, you don't want to be on that side. And I've been on this side several times of, oh, we're having heating and cooling issues. You know, it started with the uh, occupants complaining to the builder or to the architect making its way down to the HVAC technician or installer, and then making its way back to the engineer with people saying, I knew this guy didn't size the equipment right. It wasn't, you know, one ton for every 400 square foot, you know? So, um, you know, having a very accurate design to start with and then getting right into, you know, airflow distribution and CFD, uh, I mean, it's really going to complete the cycle and, 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 and solve all these issues. I've been in buildings where things should be right, things looked right, and we still had issues that we just couldn't troubleshoot. And But yeah, we had very big ceiling grills, very low CFMs, definitely on the ASHRAE 55, I'm sure we'd fall short. So having these things to minimize callbacks, minimize unpaid work and time and minimize 
Mm, you know, I'm going to sue you if this doesn't get resolved. You know, uh, there's a lot of liability for designers and and stuff like that. Plus, we're under a crunch. So much construction going on. Uh, Got to get jobs out right away. Um, so, you know, anyway, but we need to use a software. We need to use a very good software. OK, and, and all these hand calcs and rule of thumbs are just risky and, and missing certain aspects of, you know, not having accurate load calculations, not having a good uh, standard 55 analysis, not having the CFD, you know, your risk is just going up and going up and then scratching your head trying to solve problems after the fact. Um, so, you know, I'm a designer, you know, I need, uh, I need tools, uh, you know, uh, right now, I mean, or at least for even some of the residential stuff, even that I work on too, doing residential and commercial, I, I mean, I'm using multiple tools. Uh, I'm using, um, you know, my heat loss, heat gain calculation software. I'm using my ductulator. I'm probably using AutoCAD. I've got my side calculations for Excel, where I have in these built-in ADPIs and throws and all these other things and, and and all this stuff too and and you know ductulators for different materials of ducts you know um you, you know a lot of these softwares that are available today um other than uh the HVAC CFD that we're talking about here um there's a lot of inputs uh it's it's a big learning curve it's not intuitive if it's easy to miss something it's easy to make a mistake okay and these mistakes are time consuming um you know and liability issues uh you know, getting the support that you need, uh, you know, getting everything down to one software. There's a, several softwares that claim to be all in one. You know, they're really not. You know, you're really looking at something else to give you a U value of a wall. You know, you still need the, the performance information of the windows that someone's going to get or they're looking to get, you know, just assuming code minimum windows, you know, could really give you comfort issues later on down the road or even missizing equipment or, you know, not having the right airflow, the total airflow to the space, let alone the, the comfort. Um, yeah, dealing with these uh, softwares too, if, if they do have a duct design tool, you know, it takes time. So what are a lot of people doing? You know, um, they're just, you know, drawing lines in AutoCAD or even Revit and just using a friction rate. You know, do they go back and validate it? Do they go back and check their fittings? Do they have time to do it? You know, they probably don't. So, you know, many folks dealing with a ductulator and just running with it, you know, usually it doesn't lead to a balanced design. And if you can't get the right airflow to the space, going to that next level and meeting the standard 55 is, is you know, that's going to be even much more challenging to do. Uh, and again, all these other softwares, there is no flow visualization. There is no CFD, um, you know, so coming from an FEA and an MEP and Revit and, uh, you know, and some other softwares like Train and HAP, um, and then getting into uh, the HVAC CFD tools. I mean, it's a world of a difference, um, you know, and, and again, I mean, I want to minimize liability. I want to increase the value uh, uh, to my clients. You know, that's going to be more work. I could charge more for the same service. This is great business for me, and I could sleep at night and not have to worry about things. Um, you know, now explaining physics and, and sciences to building owners or, or uh, project managers or even HVAC folks. They only probably understand, you know, one ton for every 400 square foot, but they also understand building code. So it's great when we say, you know, what is this ASHRAE standard 55? What are you talking about occupant comfort? Isn't it just good enough to, you know, get 75 degrees or I want 72 degrees. That's what comfort is, 72, right? Or, you know, whatever temperature they perceive it to be. They're not even thinking relative humidity. They don't really understand relative humidity, unless we're in Florida, say, uh, you know, they don't, uh, you know, understand drafts and, and me metabolic rate and clothing and all that stuff too. So, but when you get a chance to show them, hey, look, ASHRAE standard 55, when you're talking about high performance buildings and, and green construction, lead buildings, this is required. This is what it is. That's fine if you don't understand it. I'm happy to explain it to you the best I can, but it's required and we're going to do it. Uh, it's also referenced in many other the ICC codes um, and, and the U.S. Uh, green building codes and, and stuff like that. There's a little note on just, you know, the building shall be designed in compliance with ANSI ASHRAE Standard 55. This is both in the IGCC, the International Green Construction Code, but also in your Standard 189.1. Uh,
So, um, you know, uh, this is great stuff. Uh, this is stuff that's going to cover your butt. But more importantly, you are going to, you know, I always tell people when you satisfy uh, the building, well, if you do it properly, you're, you're taking care of the occupants. Well, now we could say, you know, we're satisfying the occupants. We're going to satisfy the building for sure. Um, and that's going to make the whole picture complete. With That's what is really, you know, reducing energy consumption, reducing equipment size when you start with that occupant comfort. But of course, you have to start with the load counts first and work your way down to the CFD for the validation for the standard 55. Um, but but yeah, yeah. So uh, and, and of course, you know, why uh, standard 55? Why are we doing this? There's an example of where we need it for a lead building. But, you know, for all the things that uh, Dr. Bean and, um, you know, Sandeep have mentioned too. So you know, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I think this was very helpful uh, to understand uh, how uh, ASHRAE 55 and then the CFD stands in our building codes and how it helps designer to reduce the uh, risk of uh, litigation. It helps to create a delight for a customer. So I'll hand over to Grant. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, thank you, Tony, for the informative session. We're going to get the PowerPoint off of here in just a second. And I uh, want to talk about the importance of accurate design. Thank you for all that information, load designs, energy efficiency, building codes, and all that. But I've got a question for you. Like we threw at Robert, could you share a project or case study where the application of thumb rule load calculations led to either oversizing or undersizing? And then how accurate design calculation could have impacted that outcome? Yeah, yeah. Well, I I, I got these examples all the time. Uh, definitely in the southeast climates uh, where you have humidity for sure. Uh, when you oversize equipment, oh, it's one ton for every 400 square foot. And, you know, if I give a 3,000 square foot building in Florida where we have pretty warm, humid temperatures, you know, I'm coming up with a two and a half ton system. Uh, you know, it's a building that's well insulated, uh, very good performance windows, um, you know, but I've had people just say, you know, hey, you know, this uh, engineer, I don't like engineers. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, I want to, many installers and builders think to reduce risk is to go with bigger equipment. So yes, equipment is short cycling. Yes, people are having high electric bills. And then people are getting mold because of the high indoor humidity. And they probably took my two and a half ton duct sizing system and then put in a three and a half ton or four ton system. So now we got really low airflow and, and really almost ice cold air. So definitely condensation in the ductwork, sometimes on even, even on the outside of the ductwork too. It's that cold and you're just not getting the moisture out. Um, say on warehouses where there's a lot of uh, machinery and ovens and things like that going on too. Sure, one ton for every 400 square foot may not be adequate at all. It was just a big block in, in a, you know, R20 roof deck, but with a lot of internal stuff, you know, um, and, and I know that comes down to cooling loads, but also there was some airflow distribution that we're going to address as well because a lot of the... Um, uh, the CNC machinery and the fluids are that are kind of getting vaporized out of these things. They're making clouds. So even though we have um, we oversize, we didn't oversize the equipment, but we put on larger equipment and satisfied ventilation codes, not having the right distribution. You know, we couldn't really see the environment that was going on. We were 26 foot tall ceilings. That's how far the ductwork was. We didn't have this tool available wow. to really, you know, people are not liking the smells and the indoor air quality for sure, even though we're meeting, you know, warehouse ventilation standards and we're meeting the, the thermostat set point. So, I mean, you know, this is the missing link. Uh, uh, and, and no other software is doing this. This, this is what's great. And, and what's awesome about HVAC, it's really um, the technology in HVAC is still really new because of, you know, you guys are just getting this uh, out here. But um, again, we're still, still today, may, may, maybe most of the commercial jobs that I see on the small commercial, medium-sized commercial, you know, rules of thumb, you know, rules of thumb, rules of thumb, and it's not working. 
it's not working. And there's lawsuits all the time. I get pulled into lawsuits just for load calcs, just to redo ventilation. And you could find a bunch of problems there. Uh, and even with the duct designs and things not even being balanced, but um, being able to have a tool like this and looking at airflow distribution, showing why we have these smoke clouds just sitting here, you know, I mean, yeah. Thank you, Tony. We really appreciate that. Thank you for being here today. Now we're going to roll. Don't go away because we're going to have questions in a little bit. Let's hear from Sandeep again as he unveils the exciting new feature sets of AHC 2024. And I'm sure you're going to be amazed by the advancements this software brings to the table. Sandeep. Thanks, Grant. So thanks, Tony, Tom, uh, Robert. I think it definitely help us to uh, contextualize the product and the technology that we are developing. So we already looked at some of the features that uh, we are bringing in. Uh, I talked about data exchange in detail. So this is definitely a, a big game changer that's going to happen. We are going to able to reproduce your uh, Revit model in Simulation Hub as it is and able to run the uh, CFD very accurately. Uh, the next feature that has uh, come up is about uh, a compliance report. Uh, again, we have done, uh, I think we should do a, one more webinar about compliance, uh, actually 55 compliance in detail because just a couple of minutes won't do a justice to it. But we are doing very detailed analysis about actually 55 compliance and producing a PDF report, which is very, very valuable. The third thing is we are uh, build a fit load calculation uh, feature, which basically helps a uh, designer to calculate the loads very accurately. As Tony explained, they pay very, very crucial role in uh, simulations. And we are able to produce a, a very detailed level of load breakdowns. So space level, component level, uh, whatever the detail that you uh, would like to uh, look at. Uh, Comfort AI is, uh, again, another game-changing technology that we have developed. It basically is trained from the uh, actual CFD data, uh, the real-life sensor data. So a lot of data is amalgamated to produce this uh, uh, technology. And uh, you will see that within a few seconds, it is able to tell you what sort of comfort you are going to get. Uh, this is helps you to get into the right direction. This is a very upfront tool to make sure that you are on the right track uh, and do use CFD to do a very detailed level of analysis and produce a, a 55 compliance. Uh, so solvers, again, very crucial part in CFD. Uh, we are uh, uh, running a lot of CFD simulation, uh, high performance computing on AWS and uh, earlier version used to take a little bit more time. Uh, we are able to now reduce the time by 40%. So that definitely helps to you turn around, helps you to do more projects, more jobs. Uh, uh, and uh, it has also improved our accuracy part of it. So I think you should definitely uh, try this. So you will be amazed by the results. Uh, last but not least, we are also having a ADPF feature, which is uh, which basically <clears throat> measures the uh, how effective is your uh, diffusers layout and the uh, the mixing happening within a space. Uh, it also find out the uh, we we also build a new matrices about air change effectiveness. Very valuable to see if there is stratification happening, if there are cold spot, hot spot happening. So. These are the, some of the key features that uh, that are there in 2024 release. Uh, this is the team that has worked hard uh, day and nights to definitely bring this application to uh, the state that it is. Uh, and it's a, a young team. I would like to give a big shout for our team who has uh, produced an amazing product uh, in a really short period of time. Application is available on a subscription basis, uh, also in a, some sense of project basis. You can uh, choose a subscription uh, where you uh, pay a certain amount and use those credits over the year, or you can uh, size your project and then on a per square foot basis also you can buy a credit. So if you are not comfortable buying a credit for over a year uh, as a subscription, you can uh, do a project basis also. Uh, yeah, so I, I think uh, some, some of the uh, problems that you were facing earlier definitely have been solved. But still, let's say you have a AutoCAD drawing and you you don't know how to now bring AutoCAD drawing within our software. You just reach out to our uh, team. They will help you to create the BIM model out of it. And then from that point onward, uh, it can produce a compliance report and uh, all the analysis that is needed. 
so it can help you to produce a confidence in our product and uh, if you sign up uh, now you will get a 500 dollar free credits and uh, yeah so get to the simulationup.com and uh, start using our application right very good. Those are uh, amazing features. Uh, I'm sure the software is a game changer, uh, catering, catering to the entire needs of the uh, evolving needs of HVAC. Going to roll into the Q&A sessions. We've got some uh, questions here that we're going to get to. Uh, Sandeep, back when you were talking earlier, we had a question on if there was an option to show radiant heating and cooling as the primary system, and then would it then calculate only ventilation, ventilation airflow needed? Maybe, I don't know if that's a typo or not. Yeah, it's a ventilation, yeah. So right now okay. uh, we are not supporting uh, radiant heating, cooling uh, as an equipment. Right now we are supporting only CAV, VAV uh, systems, uh, individual air conditioning systems, cassette AC system. We, but we do plan to support that in 2025 version. So we are doing already some groundwork for that. And uh, in next year, it is definitely uh, we will have uh, radiant heating as a support. And uh, the second part about the ventilation, uh, that sounds interesting. Uh, so we will also try to reach to the user who has asked this question and uh, understand the requirement and see if we can embed that requirement also in our uh, next feature release. Very good, thank you. What engine is being used for load calculation? Yes, so currently we are using uh, CLTD uh, methods, uh, CLTD uh, advanced methods to compute those. Uh, we are also uh, working on Energy Plus uh, integration and uh, with Energy Plus, we will be able to do heat balance and uh, again, uh, other uh, advanced method uh, in this. So. Uh, we started with this as a, one of the starting point, but uh, we plan to scale this feature bigger. Very good. What is a rough cost for a room CFM simulation? So uh, I think uh, I mentioned that. So typically we charge around uh, uh, like 10 cent per square foot. Uh, so if you have a space, uh, which is like, let's say 5,000 uh, square foot, then it will cost you $500. Uh, but, uh, we realize that this itself is sometimes expensive for some of the customers. So we are, uh, helping them, uh, as I said, like for the first 5,000 square foot it's free. And then thereafter, uh, we also provide some discount to help you get into the system. Free is always good. That's a that's a good price point to go to. At least got to start there, right? Yeah. How are you overcoming poor Revit modeling? How do we? Uh, so that's very interesting. Uh, what we are doing is uh, we uh, are so if you let's say uh, using certain uh, elements uh, uh, which are of a different level of details. So in Revit, what happens is someone can do a window with very high level of details. So window can be consist of hundreds of parts. And uh, there are some equipment which have uh, almost no level of details. So we are able to take care because we are doing this data exchange where we are moving a granular data. So we are moving that this is a window, this is a door, and then we are able to uh, simplify it at our end and make sure that we are uh, uh, able to take care of these differences that occurs. Uh, for closing the uh, fluid volume uh, or the, the gaps and things, we already have a technology. Uh, if some of you are already using our uh, application for valves, where we are able to take care of open valves, or valves with the gaps, overlaps, we heal that geometry uh, using our own proprietary algorithms and then create a, a watertight uh, fluid volume. So I believe we should be able to take care of uh, even the dirty CAD or the dirty private geometry in our application. Thank you. Which is crucial parameter to be considered for most local thermal discomfort? Which is the most crucial? Uh, can you uh, repeat the question? Yeah. I can take that on if you want, Grant. Most yeah. crucial parameter to be considered from local thermal discomfort. Yeah, it's, it's very much circumstantial. And if you 
are from a warm climate, um, there's a high probability that radiant asymmetry will be the most crucial one. If you're from a cold climate, it's likely down drafts and cold floors. Uh, stratification, although does come into play, um, it have to be pretty aggressive to where you actually notice that there's a, a difference. And that is becoming less and less with high performance buildings. So again, just to reiterate in, in warmer climates is likely radiant asymmetry. And if it's a colder climate, it's likely downdrafts and uh, cold floors. Thank you, Robert. In case you didn't yeah. know, that was Robert speaking from the other. <laughs> um, interested, interested to know how the software simulates part load conditions. Heat dissipation from equipment or part lighting operations could be due to natural light being used, et cetera. Uh, I think uh, what we are able to do is we are able to specify the, uh, the wattage and the, the heat load that each of the equipment will have. Uh, I think Praveen would know more uh, about this, but uh, with that, you can run with uh, partial uh, it loads also. Uh, are you, Praveen, are you there? Uh, like yes, yes. Uh, we can uh, simulate for part load conditions as well. So we, are op we have opened all the uh, heat load. User can also edit and select what should be the like, internal heat load to be considered for the simulation. It is possible. OK. Next, can you plan the air terminal in AHC? I think it is can be planned. The uh, uh, if it is that way, this yes, there is a library of uh, air terminals we provide, and user can choose and pick and place them. Yes, that's the. Thank you. Engine heating problems can be detected through what should be the normal temperature for hot and cold. I'm not sure that's a question. It sounds more like a statement. Maybe it's can engine heating problems be detected? Javier, if you can uh, clarify your question, we'd appreciate that. We're not sure what that is. Let me uh, grab the next one here. Interested to know how software simulates partial loads um, oh, we already answered that one. It just got repeated. Sorry about that, guys. How can we compare the software with other commercially available thermal CFD analysis software, such as ANSYS and others? Uh, we have done a lot of validation uh, projects uh, where we are uh, uh, validating with not just with ANSYS, but with the real conditions. So we are uh, testing it on a, a, a real environment. So we are taken several projects uh, for offices and commercial uh, environment where we have put a, a, a grid sensors uh, to uh, measure the all the important key parameters uh, like temperature, humidity, CO2, uh, radiant temperatures. And then uh, we also predict the same with uh, uh, our application. And we have got a very accurate uh, uh, validation with that. It's like around 90% accurate uh, to what the real things are and uh, i think we have a, a blog or paper about this uh, we will share that uh, with you first of all okay thank you is there any case study that shows matching results of actual data recorded of hca HAV, hvac and live working versus calculated data through cfd i think i just answered that question so we have this okay. uh, study and uh, we will share that with you Okay, very good. Uh, for all, we've got about five minutes left. So if you have a question, please get it in before we end. How will Comfort AI help the user when designing a system? Uh, so Comfort AI uh, helps in like you have, uh, uh, you start with a certain hit load calculation and then you start assuming, uh, you start with going with a certain rule of thumbs to place the diffusers and the returns. So now once you have put that, it starts to validate with that, uh, okay, whether this is helpful. Uh, is it going to produce a draft? Is it going to create a local discomfort? And those inputs uh, then helps a user to uh, understand why that is uh, local, the, the discomfort is happening. And then he changes uh, diffuser layouts 
or the system. Uh, what we realize even uh, if someone is doing a heat load calculation in some different software, and if he has uh, made some mistake also, that also is able to somehow figure out. So it's a very interesting tool. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, you to try it out. It's a new technology, so it has some tethering issue, but it definitely provides you a good direction uh, for exploring the right design. Very good. Uh, would you like to repeat the free trial offer? I think that was an amazing offer you made. Would you like to repeat that? Yeah, so, uh, I right, yeah, uh, I think uh, right now, as you said, uh, uh, the product is live. Uh, you go there and just log in. You will get a 5,000 square foot uh, of a project done for free. So it would have normally cost you $500 uh, that is available for uh, free. Very good. And they can uh, submit that design and get it looked at. That yes. is great stuff. That's another thing. We so want to you, thank. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to thank all of our esteemed panelists. We're going to kind of head toward the end there. We got no new questions. We thank uh, Tony and Robert for being here today. And of course, Sandeep and the, and the team behind the scenes. Thank you to everyone. Remember that designing sustainable and efficient HVAC systems are a key to a greener future. And of course, this event's recording will be available on YouTube. And for any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to the Simulation Hub team. Best of luck with all of your HVAC design endeavors. We appreciate you being here today. Best to you.